quite a beautiful gospel uh, for today with a lot going on in it. But I want to highlight just a couple of points. First of all is that Luke, right away, is already in the middle of his gospel looking towards the end. Looking towards the end of Christ's mission, and not just his passion and his death, but also his ascension. When the days for Jesus' being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem. We're not just talking about a few days, we're talking about this whole process of Christ preparing himself, but not only preparing himself for his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension, but also preparing his apostles. He sends messengers ahead of him along the way. And they enter this Samaritan village. And what exactly is a Samaritan? Well, there was the capital of Samaria, or the Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. When in the Old Testament, the two kingdoms of Israel broke away, and you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Jerusalem being the capital of the southern kingdom. But what happens in the history of the Holy Land is the Assyrians come in and they capture part of the northern kingdom. And along with the capturing of that part of the northern kingdom and also Samaria itself is that the pagan worship of the Assyrians begins to be mixed along with the uh, Jewish practices. And even the Jews begin to marry pagans, right, from, uh, from Assyria. And so the southern kingdom does not have a high opinion of Samaritans. This is why they're always seen as people that shouldn't be conversed with or or you shouldn't talk with them or you shouldn't even enter uh, their villages, right? But then the Samaritans saw the Jews as just self-righteous and stuck up, right? And so they didn't want to talk to those who rejected them, even those who were from Samaria, and they actually continued living faithfully according to the Jewish law and covenant. So, James and John. Right in the spirit of Elijah says, do you want us to call down fire in order to consume their city? Now, why would they have brought up this reference to Elijah? Well, Elijah, when he was dealing with the pagan worship uh, to the god Baal from the priests of Baal, right, we can remember what he did on Mount Carmel. He goes up and he says, let's see who has the real god, your gods or my god. He said, so let's, let's have a little competition. And so... Right? The priests of Baal, they prepare their sacrifice on the altar, and they're praying to Baal to send down fire, and they're dancing, and they're, um, and they're uh, chanting, and they're singing, and they're praying. And old Elijah is off on the side, laughing and mocking them. Right? Just saying, oh, where's your God now? Did he lose his ears? Can he not hear your prayers? Right? And they're getting more and more upset. And he says, so that you know that... Adonai is the true God and the one God. He then takes water, buckets of it, and he soaks the altar. He soaks all of the offerings that are there that he has prepared. And he digs a moat around it. And he even submerges that in water. And with one prayer, fire comes down and consumes his offering. And so, in a certain way, when James and John, who are now, right, these are the, the, the sons of thunder. They say, Lord, look at these pagans, right, offering sacrifice to their pagan gods. Should we call down the same prayer of Elijah in order to consume them in their city? And our Lord says, no. He rebukes them, and he just goes on to the next village. There's already been an Elijah. There's already been a zeal that has been lived in that prophet, and he doesn't want more of that. He doesn't want the condemnation. He wants to just move on to those who are listening and who will be alive in his word. For this reason, St. Paul can say to the Galatians, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Namely, you should love your neighbor as yourself, but if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not, beware that you are not consumed by one another, that you breed in the other contempt. The condemnation is for one reason, and that is to bring someone back to the practice of the faith, and not in any self-righteous way, as if the glory of God will be shown by destruction, because it breeds destruction in others as well. Remember that our Lord is the new Moses, and we see this in the very fact that in Luke's gospel, this word way is a direct translation from the Hebrew, right? Jesus sets out on the way, and he sends messengers ahead of him. Right? This way, this, this, the word in Hebrew for way is hodos, which is actually easy to remember because the Hebrew word for 
leaving a place or escape is exodus, exodus. And so our Lord, as he sets out on the way, right, he's laying down a new law. He's laying down the fulfillment of the law, which is love of God and zeal for him before all else, even before the law. And so in this zeal, there's many who are attracted to it, and they run up to our Lord, and they say, Lord, I want to follow you. But he has to tell them, do you know what you will give up? Do you know what, is, what it's about to follow me? One runs up and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, I have nowhere to lay my head. It's better to be an animal with a nest or a den than it is to be one of my followers and have to deny your own home because I will call you wherever I need you to go. Another says, follow me. And remember that the Jewish law here is that the dead must be buried within three days of their passing. Right? And Christ says, or he says, follow me. And this man says, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And he answers him, let the dead bury their dead. What an odd phrase. Right? Like someone's going to come back from the dead to bury his dead. No, remember he has just left this place and someone's coming running after him. And he says, let me go bury my father. Why does he say, let the dead bury the dead? Because those who he has left behind are dead because they would not listen to his word. He would not listen to his apostles who he sent to prepare his way. And so spiritually, they're dead inside because they have not accepted his word. Let those people bury the dead, but you come have life with me now. Nothing can hold you back. This is the same thing that happens with Elisha and Elijah. Right? In a certain way, James and John probably could have said, right, why are you bringing Elijah into this? And Jesus would have said, you brought him into it first by wanting to call down fire. But notice how even Elisha says, well, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Elijah has no time for that. He's doing the will of the Lord. The Lord says, go to this young man and call him unto my service in your name. He didn't say, let him, you know, dine with his family and say goodbye. Believe me, it would be wonderful when the Lord calls someone to service that they could spend all the time they wanted to with their loved ones. I know this, I'm moving tomorrow. And it would be nice if I would have more time to spend to say goodbye. And yet, when we're called to the Lord's service, there's, there's nothing more that we can do but respond. The important thing in this gospel is that our Lord is saying to follow him, we cannot place a condition on our discipleship. We cannot place an excuse on our discipleship, on following him. And many times we do have conditions when we take in some service. Right? It's almost like the, the joke that priests tell that it's like, yeah, I'll be a priest because I know the bishop will eventually give me a nice mountain parish with a little lake, maybe a golf course nearby. It's like, no, it's not conditioned on that. We go where we are called. Or sometimes when two people are preparing for marriage and you kind of hear something in someone's voice, they say, I will love this person if these conditions are met. No, it's a vocation. It's an all-in. There can be no condition placed on that. Or sometimes we can even say, Lord, I will follow you, and I want this in return. I want all of my material needs met. I want comfort. I want happiness. I don't want to lack for anything. But with that attitude, then we're always going to be asking the Lord for more of what we want and not listening to his voice telling us what he wants of us. And so, my brothers and sisters, if we ask our Lord, shine the light of your grace on the conditions that I have put that hold me back from serving you, that hold me back from being all in, if we ask him that prayer, he will shine the light of his grace into our hearts, you can see how we're holding back. And we're not allowing him to be king and emperor of our own hearts. And so I invite you, if something is, is in your mind or in your heart in which you say, I have conditioned this relationship, I've, con I've conditioned it in saying that I want this in return, place that condition tonight in the chalice is it's raised to Almighty God, and allow it to be drowned there from this day forward. So that you can walk out of this church 100% with that zeal that he wants, not in condemnation, not in devouring one another, 
but just following him wherever he goes and wherever he beckons and calls us. In the responsorial psalm, we said, You are my inheritance, O Lord. Do we truly mean that? Do we truly live as if he is our only inheritance, union with him? He hasn't promised us any joy, any kindness, anything in this life. And when they do come to us, those things to enjoy and those blessings to cherish, they're pledges of future glory. They're pledges saying, keep going. It gets better. At the end of this pilgrim journey, at the end of our exodus, right at the end of the way from slavery to sin and into eternal life, there is a great inheritance and all these things have been pointing to it because they're pledges of the more to come in eternal life. Lord, we do not want to be conditioned in our relationship with you, but we want to be all in. Allow us to be 100% on fire for you tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is Father Carter's last Sunday Mass with us here at St. Mark. We just give him a round of applause. Thank you so much, Father Carter. Please be with me. Uh-huh. 